Welcome, members and guests. Um, today is Tuesday, February the 8th, 2022. I hereby call the local government committee to order. Madam Clerk, you will please take the roll. Representatives Calfee, Carr, Chisholm, Gant, Helton, Hodges, Holesclaw, Leatherwood, Love, Manis, Miller, Moody, Moon, Reedy, Rudd, Shaw, Williams, Vice Chairman Wright, Chairman Crawford. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, let the record reflect Representative Carr is excused today. Are there any personal orders or announcements from the members? Seeing none, today we have five bills on the calendar. Uh, we'll start with uh, House Bill 1684 by Leader Lambreth. Pro proper motion in second on the bill. Leader Lambreth, you're recognized, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. This bill is very simple. It's one paragraph. It just says that our, our locally elected officials serving a legislative body have to declare the same conflict that we do. So if they're voting on the budget or something else and they have a specific conflict, they can still vote. They just have to stand up and tell folks, hey, I have a conflict on this. That's what the bill does, Mr. Chairman. Any questions on the bill? Seeing none, we're ready to vote. All those in favor of House Bill 1684 moving on, say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Bill moves on to calendar and rules. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're recognized on House Bill 1708. Do I have a motion? Proper motion in second. You're recognized, Leader Lambert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and this as well is a, a very short bill. It just says, notwithstanding any law to the contrary, a judicial candidate may personally solicit and accept campaign contributions. Currently, there is a barrier between a judge being able to directly ask somebody for a campaign contribution. That same judicial candidate signs their forms and indicating that they're accurate, just like we do. So they review who's given to their campaigns and that same judicial candidate, which they're all up and running this year, um, goes to their fundraisers or presumably if they want to have a successful fundraiser, they actually show up to their own fundraiser. So it's, it's not like they're not shaking hands and thanking those folks and know who gives. Uh, so all this says is they can actually ask those folks directly or not if they don't want to. I mean, they can still keep a barrier between them and, and requesting for a donation. But if they would like to go ahead and just do as each of us are allowed to do, they can call donors and actually request uh, funds during the fundraising time periods. You've heard the explanation of the bill. Representative Shaw, you're recognized for a question. Thank you. I just had one question, Mr. Leader. Uh, I see what you're doing here. How does that affect them in terms of? Well, I guess this is kind of a weedy question, but if I'm a judge and I get this huge donation from somebody, uh, what what did the law say about that? Same thing it says about ours. Breedle Rambus, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and yes, I mean, in essence, if... Uh, a judge feels like they got a contribution that in any way, shape, form, or fashion, either currently or under this, whether they ask for it or not, if somebody gave to their campaign and it in any way affects their ability to be a fair and impartial judge, they need to recuse themselves from that case. Whether they ask for it personally or just saw it on a list or saw that person at the fundraiser, it's the same thing. I mean, and I want to be crystal clear, uh, this would... This statute would trump any rule or procedure or ruling that has been made by any other unelected body that is out there. So if some ethics panel or something tells them they can't fundraise, this would be in state law that they absolutely could. Um, but that does not change any of those ethical decisions or opinions by those bodies on if someone got a large contribution, whether or not they would be forced to recuse themselves. Uh, that is the case now. It will be the case if this bill is successful and should always be the case, in my humble opinion. Follow up, Mr. Shaw. Uh, Representative Miller, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Leader. Are we basically saying that this bill will make judges pretty much equal to legislators when it comes to fundraising, campaign fundraising? Leader Lambert, you're recognized. Thank you. I, I have not looked at the specific individual limits to see whether or not they are allowed to raise what we can. Um, I could look that up, but this doesn't change anything as far as what their individual fundraising limits are, but it would give them the freedom to be able to directly request funds just as we do when they're running for public office. Follow up, Mr. Miller. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions? Mr. Chairman, follow yes. up. We are prohibited from raising funds, for example, now in the legislature. Would, would uh, the judges be prohibited while they're on the bench from raising funds or soliciting? And, and we run every two years. They run every eight years. 
to this point, I don't know why they got eight years, but that's Hello? a judge calling. That's a judge calling. <laughs> uh, anyway. Leader Lambert, you're recognized for response. Thanks, Mr. Chairman and, and Representative Miller. That wasn't me calling you, I promise. And, and <laughs> so I, there are some prohibitions on when judges can and cannot raise. Again, I've never run for judge, never planned to ever run for judge. Um, I like serving in this body and being an interactive part of the proceedings. The judge is kind of, you know, up above it and is kind of the referee, so to speak. I, I am probably going to misstate this and I apologize, but I believe it's 120 days. There are some folks that have helped with judicial races in this room, but there is, whether it's 120 days or, or whatever prescribed time before their election is the only time they can really raise money. They're not able to raise just any and every time. And I think there's a very short time after their election. None of this changes any of that. So all of the same restrictions that they have on time period just like we have restrictions during session not be able to raise, this doesn't change any. And I may be a little off on the days, whether it's 120 days, 180 before, but there's a prescribed time period that they're able to raise. None of this changes any of that. It just says that they, and I know it sounds ridiculously simple, but it's a big deal, that they can ask for the, you know, they can solicit the contribution. They can call you and say, Representative Miller, I'm running for blah, 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 and I would deeply appreciate your support. We're having a fundraiser Friday night. Could you give X amount of dollars? It just literally gives them the freedom to do that. Follow up. Yes, sir. And, and thank you for that. But but again, I'm trying to understand. If, if they're going to be anywhere close to being equal to what we have to do, the, the question remains, and we probably would have to find the answer to the question. Will they be able to solicit funds? while they are actually on the bench. Oh. And again, they're on the bench for eight years. Yeah. So within that period, would they be able to solicit funds for their next election, which would be eight years from Leader Lambert, the last election? So they cannot solicit funds while they are on the bench. And I, I believe that there are other laws that prohibit them from doing it on state time. OK, so they can't do that. Like, you know, they can't be on the bench and like call somebody up and say, hey, by the way, I'm fundraising. They obviously cannot do that. All right. During their term of office, just as we can. Right. Yes, they can solicit funds, but none of this changes the time period and the restrictions on when that can occur. So, no, this does not change this. It All that stays exactly the same. It literally allows them to pick up the phone. Chairman Rudd, you're recognized. Uh, yes, thank you, thank you for bringing this. Um, I've, over the years before I got elected state rep, I guess I've managed over 10 judicial races and it's kind of ridiculous. They, there is a certain time period, I believe it is 120 days for an election when they can start fundraising for the reelection. But what's odd is their treasurer can stand behind them or their wife and they say, I can't accept money but he can, mm -hmm. and they just give them the envelope. When you send a, when you send an invitation out, it says our treasurer is accepting money uh, at the fundraiser. It's just ridiculous to restrain them like that. Um, and they do have separate laws, and the canons is what they're called, mm -hmm. and the Supreme Court sets all those rules. Your bill doesn't change any of their restrictions or laws. It just simply says they can accept funds, and it's about time. I, it's, it's ridiculous that they're so restrained during that short period of time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Leader Lambeth, you're recognized for response. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and well said. That That's exactly what it does. I mean, right now, somebody walks up to an envelope with a judge at their own fundraiser with their own sign out front, and they have to go, whoop, I can't touch that. Give that to the person standing right here. And it's almost comical to watch. I mean, it's just, it doesn't change any of the rest of this. It just allows them to at least take the envelope and say, thank you very much for your support. Representative Leatherwood. I think what you're proposing uh, makes sense on the surface and i've had similar thoughts to chairman rudd in this regard but just want to make sure that we are not um overriding anything else you made the comment that there might be other rules or regs out there uh that might have restrictions in them but this would actually be the law now mm -hmm. and so just want to make sure that um we will not override any of those restrictions. I don't know if we can go uh, out of session and hear from legal briefly on what some of those um, guidelines are, because I think I've heard one number thrown around, which might not be correct. Thank you, Representative Leatherwood. I don't think we need to go out of session. I'll recognize the leader to answer that question. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, to be crystal clear, to make sure the intent of this bill is, is on the record, it is absolutely not my intention to change any other canons of judicial ethics or any of the rules that they have to abide by or any of the recusal procedures that they would have to go through. It literally just changes and does override the one rule that they cannot personally solicit or accept <laughs> contributions. And this just says a judicial candidate may personally solicit and accept campaign contributions. And it, it is not the intent nor the effect of this to override any of the additional canons of judicial ethics that they must abide by. Okay, that's good. I appreciate that clarification. And to just throw it out there, um, it's my understanding that they can raise funds 365 days before the election day. And that was a number I was thinking uh, could possibly get out there from a more authoritor authoritative source than me if anyone wants to. But that's my understanding. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Shaw. Uh, you're recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just want to say, and I ask a question, but real quickly, really this bill stops them from bootlegging. Representative. It, it, it really does. I, I just want to go on record saying that because in the future, why we may not know, I think there's been a little hankling around, but I think this put things in perspective. Any other questions for the leader on this bill? Representative Miller, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to refer to Representative Letterwood when he suggested or said something about they are able to raise money 365 days. What was he referring to? Leader Lambert. Again, there is nothing in this bill that changes. I don't know if it's 120, 365. As I specified earlier, there is a time period, to your question earlier, that they can raise. There is a time period that they are prohibited from raising. Those time, period, those time periods do not change at all. Uh, but as our, our learned colleague to your right said, this does make it just an honest process where if the good judge is going to ask for money, they got to do it themselves. They got to own it themselves. And if it creates a recusal problem, it creates a recusal problem. I mean, it just puts it all above board. Representative Miller. Mr. Leedy, if, if it is found to be true that they are able to raise funds 360 or solicit or ask for funds 365 days a year, would you consider an amendment that would prohibit them from raising those dollars only until there's an election period, the, the, the election period? Leader Lambreth. Mr. Chairman, I, no, sir, with all due respect, I don't want to go into any of that. I, I want to keep this bill nice and simple where it just says they can solicit funds within whatever time periods that they're currently allowed to or not allowed to. And we leave up to that, that up to the judicial branch or wherever they want to put that. Um, I, that gets into a whole different area. I'm literally just talking about with this bill, one sentence that they can personally ask for the contribution. Uh, if you wanted to bring a bill dealing with their time periods and all that, that, that is between you and the judiciary, but I'm trying to keep this as simple as possible. Any other questions? Seeing none, I think we're ready to vote. All those in favor of House Bill 1708, moving on, say aye. Opposed, no. Bill moves on to calendar and rules. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, House Bill number 1868, uh, Chairman Vaughn, this is item number three. I have another bill to present in another committee. I'm going to do that. So at this time, I will pass the gavel to Vice Chairman Wright. We do have a speaker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. <clears throat> what House Bill... 1868 proposes is the removal of rank choice voting or otherwise known as instant runoff voting from being an option. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Presenter. Uh, do we have a motion? A second. Thank you. I just need to make sure we're in proper state. I want you as comfortable as you can be, Mr. Chairman. This is not going to happen today. <laughs> I want you to be comfortable. Please present your bill. Thanks. Yes, sir. Again, House Bill 1868 uh, removes the possibility of, or prohibits the use of ranked choice voting or instant runoff voting for state and local elections throughout the state of Tennessee. The uh, 
Ranked choice voting, it's a system of voting where voters rank candidates in order of preference. And if no candidate receives a majority of the votes, then election officials perform rounds of reallocating, redistributing, and essentially recounting the votes among the candidates until one candidate receives a majority of the votes. Our concerns that this has provided, and also I'm, I'm happy to say this is a bipartisan bill. Some my co-sponsors are from across the aisle on it. Uh, the counting method is confusing and complex. Uh, I had to look at it myself and, and I get paid to deal with numbers. I had to work through the process several times before I could present this bill to understand the way that uh, the system worked. Uh, it's gonna create a lack of confidence in the vote totals. Uh, I think as we have seen over the last few election cycles, people want simplicity, transparency, and clarity in vote counting. Uh, this will not aid in that at all, which will, in my mind, believe that it leads to a lack of confidence in the vote totals that are produced. There will be voter confusion in the voting process. Uh, I have examples of uh, in Minneapolis that they ran out of ballots because people were confused uh, and would mess one up and have to go request another one because they didn't fully understand the process. Uh, it's gonna be slow and costly. Uh, the, the, we believe that ranked choice voting will provide uh, a longer time period before actual winners are declared. And again, it will require a great number of ballots to be handled and gone through. We're gonna spend a lot of money on it. Uh, in Shelby County, where the city of Memphis had altered their charter to, um, to allow ranked choice voting prior to the election uh, commissioners, uh, or excuse me, the uh, director of elections, stating that he didn't believe Tennessee law allowed it as it was currently stated. The election commission estimated that it was gonna cost about $26,000 per district to redo the voting machines. And then on top of that, it was gonna be about another $50,000 in voter education, uh, voter education efforts. And then there will be the inevitable challenges of the results, of the cost to count and defend those results. And then at the end of all of this, at the end of this, there's no guarantee that the winner will have a majority of the votes. We're, there's op, there's um, examples where in past elections where they've gone through the ranked choice voting and they still didn't get to a majority winner even after all of that. And so what we would like to do, this is a the only time this has been approved in the state of Tennessee has been the city of Memphis charter. Again, uh, election uh, director of elections for the Secretary of State's office had rendered an opinion that state law did not allow this. And so what we'd like to do is we'd just like to clean up the matter so we can end the conversation and concentrate on providing as clear and transparent of an election process for our citizens as possible. I'll be happy to answer any questions, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before we get into the questions and answers of the committee, I believe we have approved for testimony one uh, presenter and for that presentation, we will be out of session. And I would ask if Mr. Chris Saxman is present. Yes, sir. Uh, you, you may seat yourself at the desk. And if you're ready to go, um, I would ask that you give your name and organization representing. Uh, my name is Chris Saxman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm a former member of the House of Delegates in Virginia, served for four terms. I now run a nonprofit, nonpartisan pro-business organization in which we analyze elections for the business community. Um, I came here at the request of, a, of an organization that I'm not representing. I'm here because of the experience I, that I uh, had in Virginia with ranked choice voting for the Republican Party of Virginia in the 2021 cycle. And if you're familiar with that election cycle, probably not as much as, uh, as most, but the Virginia Republicans could not come to an agreement on how they were gonna nominate their statewide ticket for 2021. There has been a growing um, fight between the convention and primary people, if you will. And they just couldn't come to an understanding of how they were gonna conduct their own election. This is outside the state. This is the, the party apparatus. They basically were out of tools. 
and they had one left. It was ranked choice voting in a convention format, which they chose and ultimately used very successfully uh, and were able to win a statewide election, I think is one of the key reasons is because they went to ranked choice voting. Uh, the outcome of that election in which there were multiple candidates in the three statewide offices of governor, lieutenant governor, and attorney general, they weren't able to uh, attack each other with the uh, usual enthusiasm they, they have. Um, and as a result, the Republican Party of Virginia was able to come together uh, much more uh, effectively and quickly to, to gather themselves for the general election. Um, after that election, a friend of mine who won lieutenant governor, we served in the House together in 2002, we were elected the same year. She asked me to be her transition director and win some Sears. And I asked her what it was like to be a candidate in that format. I'm now a political director for it. And I'm not in any way representing her or her organization, although she's a friend, probably would say hello. But the, the reality was the, the candidates themselves were able to uh, put aside their differences because they couldn't attack their opponents because they needed the votes of those candidates, voters, later in, in later rounds of balloting. Um, to, to, the, to, the, to the gentleman's uh, testimony, those later rounds created a lot more transparency because a lot more people were paying attention to every ballot that was being counted. And I thought as a former history and government teacher, it was actually quite, uh, quite a stunning accomplishment the Republican Party pulled off. And it was very engaging for the rest of the electorate. Uh, the Republicans expanded the number of people who voted in their convention format from usually eight to 10,000 to over 70,000. Uh, they did it very successfully, less expensively, um, and that's one of the, the other factors that uh, can be in, included in your in your understanding of this issue. And I came here uh, not necessarily say, oh, you've got to do every election this way. It's not at all. Just don't take a tool out of your toolbox because eventually you might need something like this in your elections. Um, and I would uh, hard uh, I would hope that you might want to study the issue uh, and come to a, a conclusion and see how it's actually done versus hearing testimony from around the country. I mean, Tennessee should do what Tennessee wants to do. I would never suggest that you do it the way Virginia does. Please, dear God, don't do that. I've been there too long. But the other state that has done it very successfully is the Utah Republican Party. They've had a, a very long history with this and have been very successful at it. Yes, sir. And, and uh, let me apologize for being remiss in saying to begin with, I'd like to see your comments within three, three to five minutes. If you, okay. could, if you well. could take one more minute and I'll, sum sum up your position, and then stand for questions. Yes, sir. Your closing but, comment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I'm a former history teacher. I can cover 45 minutes without without missing no, a beat. Okay. But, no, okay. No, I won't I do that to I you. I can't stand 45. <laughs> no, <laughs> not and not before lunch. I know my, I'm at great peril anyway. Um, I, f from a governing perspective, I think you need every tool in your toolbox. You don't have to use this all the time or any time, but you might need it one time, and that's what the Virginia Republicans discovered. Okay. Are there questions of this presenter? Seeing none, we will be back in session and the gavel is passing to the chairman. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to chair in your absence. Uh, we have had the initial presentation of the presenter and then outside testimony, and we are now back to uh, I would assume questions of the committee to the presenter. Oh, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this time I'll recognize Chairman Moon for a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. In some of your earlier remarks, uh, I took it there was, is, to your knowledge, is there any pending litigation on this matter? Chairman Vaughn, you're recognized? Uh, no, sir. I believe she was an administrative judge, but uh, uh, dismissed the lawsuit by several prospective Memphis City Council folk candidates who had filed suit against uh, Director Goins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions? Representative Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Vine, for clarification, is this statewide, although Shelby County is the only county that is actually uh, voted for uh, instant runoff. Chairman Vaughn, right. you're recognized. Uh, it is statewide and actually, I believe correctly uh, stated, I believe the city of Memphis is the only one that has, has it approved in their charter uh, for ranked choice voting. Follow up, 
Yes, but, but again, it's, it's statewide. This, this has but statewide. That will this will prohibit any city and or county from this point. Yes, sir. From, from actually ballot. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Representative Shaw, you're recognized. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to the chairman of the, uh, who has the legislation, I actually voted, as you know, against it last week. And one of the reasons why I did was because of what we just heard about that tool in the toolbox. And I guess some of those people from Shelby County before you did got to me first. Uh, but because you all are from Shelby County, if that's what y'all want to do, I don't have no problem with it at this point. But I had heard the very same thing that was said to us today about it being a tool in the toolbox that could sometime be useful to be used. And I was kind of just following what I had already heard, but I'm kind of at a point where I'm neutral or whatever y'all want to do. I just want to get that on record, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Vaughn, you're recognized for a response. Uh, thank you for the clarification, Representative Shaw. Any other questions? Seeing none, I think we're ready to vote on uh, House Bill 1868. All in favor of House Bill 1868, moving on to calendar and rules, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Aye. Bill moves on to calendar and rules. If you want to be recorded as a no, please see the clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee, and Mr. Phil-Ed Chairman. <laughs> Item number four, House Bill 1728 by Representative Baum. We have a proper motion and second on the bill. Uh, Representative Baum, you are recognized. Thank you, Chairman Crawford. This is a bill that would make two changes to our public finance statutes. The first change would be to make it clear that a local government must notify the comptroller when they're going to reissue revenue bonds the same way they're currently required to notify the comptroller when they reissue general obligation bonds. It just makes revenue bonds and general obligation bonds sort of on the same footing. And the second of the two pieces to this bill have to, the second piece has to do with newspapers. Currently in the code, when a utility authority uh, is gonna issue a note or a bond, uh, they are required to publish information about this issuance in every newspaper served by the utility within one week. And this revision to the code would say that they're required to publish this information in only one newspaper, either the newspaper where the utility's primary office is or the newspaper of the county where the utility primarily serves. The motivation for this second change is newspapers are less and less in circulation. It's becoming harder and harder to find a newspaper that circulates regularly in such a way that would satisfy the current requirement for this information to be published in a newspaper for all the counties served by the utility within seven days of the information being provided by the comptroller's office. Any questions for the representative? Seeing none, we're ready to vote on House Bill 1728. Moving on to calendar and rules. All in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Your bill moves on to calendar and rules, sir. Thank you all. Item number five on today's agenda is House Bill 1902 by Representative Brickett. Second. Got a proper motion and second on the bill. Let the record reflect that I, in my office, I have received a two-thirds majority resolution from the governing body. At this time, you're recognized, Representative Brickett. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This bill is for Coffee County. It simply aligns the highway commissioner's uh, the rule to the new four rural districts of the county that they redistricted uh, with the, the census information. So it's just lining up the highway commissioners to the rural districts in our county. Any questions for Representative Bricken? Seeing none, we're ready to vote on House Bill 1902, moving on to calendar and rules. All in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Bill moves on to calendar and rules. Before we close, uh, does anybody have any announcements or personal orders? Seeing none, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. We are adjourned.